What is up, everyone? I hope you all got the notification. We're going to want to make sure that everyone uh, can hear me. We're trying to do something a little bit different. And doing a live on YouTube is something that I've been wanting to do. I've been wanting to do a recap of these tournaments and go a little bit more in depth for some of my viewers out there. Hold up. Image frozen. No sound. Let's see what we can do here. Check, check. One, two. Check, check. Image frozen. Everybody's got it? You guys got sound. Give me a thumbs up if you got me. It looks like I have sound. Yep. Okay, right, we're good. Okay, it's good now. Awesome. Awesome. So this is like the first time that I'm doing this. So there are going to be some technical difficulties. It's going to happen. Um, but I wanted to go in depth a little bit more of some of the recap of the tournament at Heavy Hitters, but also just talking about bass fishing in general and sort of some of the transitions that we see day in and day out. Um, traveling across the country. So just giving you a little bit of a backstory, um, you know, of heavy hitters and that event, Sharon Harris and, and Fishing Falls and all that. Basically, before we got there, um, the water on those lakes um, had been, we had a really cold March. A lot of us um, had to deal with a pretty cold February, March, and it warmed up in the middle of March and really had those big warming trends. I think a few fish might have tried to spawn in certain areas of the country, especially down south. Did not anticipate that to be the deal. So I figured going to this event, it was going to be a major pre-spawn spawn transition, which is this can actually be a little bit of a tough time of a year to, um, to, to it sort of can be a tough time of year to figure them out because what happens is a lot of times the fish will try to transition up and try to move into those areas. And they almost, I feel like they start to swim um, they're swimming so much, they're not worried about feeding. They're not really worried. They're trying to get to these spawning areas um, and set up shop. And so that was something I didn't know exactly what uh, what phase of those fish were ultimately going to be in, but I anticipated that was probably what it was going to be. Once I dropped my boat in on Falls Lake of the first day of practice, the water temperature was close to 60 degrees. So instantly I am thinking when that water hits that 59, 60 degrees with the moon phase or warming trend in that March or April time period, um, a lot of times I'm anticipating a spawn to be happening. Those fish are going to move up. They're going to try to come in um, and, and try to at least spawn. Now, the thing you have to think about, no matter what lake you're on in the country, the other thing is, okay, water level plays a huge role. Is the water fluctuating? Is the water dropping? And is it falling? So prior to going to that event, I could tell the water was dropping on Falls Lake. And it dropped about a foot, which a foot... Uh, it had been high and it came sort of gradually going down. And what ultimately happened was I felt like that can really change a way, uh, the, change the way the fish feel if they feel comfortable um, or, or they're feeling a little bit like vulnerable in certain areas. So like what I'm, I'll sort of give you like for instance. So if the water's coming up, um, a lot of times the fish will feel pretty, pretty uh, comfortable on flatter banks and spawn on flatter banks. If the water tends to be dropping, they tend to want to set up deeper and spawn deeper on the steeper banks because ultimately that gives them a better chance of, of their spawn um, and, and those, those fry or those eggs hatching in it and having a, a very, a, you know, a good spawn, um, successful spawn. So that is sort of like the mindset. Fish do things for a reason. They actually, there's a reason behind it. So I, I knew like probably the better banks were going to be the steeper banks, the banks that ultimately had a little bit more depth. Um, and, and prior to going into that event, uh, you know, the past time I was on falls, the only time I've been on falls, I caught them in the upper portion, upper portion of the lake. Um, knowing that was probably going to get a little bit more pressure because it had been a lot of anglers realized that, that was a productive area. Um, and with the water falling and being below full pool, I knew there probably wasn't going to be a ton of water up that way. Um, by the tournament starting, the water was actually almost a half of a foot below full pool, which is like, I mean, that's a lot for that lake, actually. It's sort of funny because I, I, I sort of always joked, like, Falls Lake, if they just had that where the water level would stay up a half foot above full pool or a foot, it's like that would be the perfect water level for it to be awesome. So, Anyway, diving into a little bit of the backstory of what I sort of was anticipating, um, pre-spawn to spawn transition can be very difficult. It really can. And so when I started practice, I anticipated, okay, you know, vibrating jigs. 
Yep, definitely got to have that. That's going to work actually pretty well. The pre-spawn really well. I'm um, the pre-spawn, and it actually catches fish, you know, during the spawn. It will catch them. I try to go with the bluegill colors, um, and so I, I played with that, okay? Another thing, a Rapala OG crankbait. That is something that, for me, in that transition, you know, cranking transition banks, not all of the fish will spawn at once. And so I think that a lot of times as an angler, I – I tend to do this. I know I've had done this several times throughout my career where I try, I almost feel like every bash should be on the bank or every bash should be doing one thing on the lake. And that just does not happen. Typically there are bass behind those fish that are doing something a little bit different or that are put, actually coming up and moving up um, on the same banks that some of the pre, those pre spawners that moved into spawn were actually left. So this is something that I wanted to keep, um, keep, you know, at least try it. And, and what I come to find out, and then of course, you know, I had to pick up a jerk bait and I picked up a jerk bait and threw a jerk bait in practice utilizing active target. But I figured it out basically throughout the first day of practice that that was not what was transpiring. Those fish were not, there were some fish out there on, in post spawners. I caught some fish, but it didn't seem like it seemed like the majority of the fish were still like pre-spawn or just pulling up to spawn. And now looking back, and, and this is a thing that like allows you, I try to reflect on events and look back into the events that I fished and or like at least into like what went down during practice. And I, what I feel like what ultimately went down is I started with getting a couple bites on a swim bait, getting a couple bites flipping, and I had probably like six to ten bites. And those fish had pulled up big time. Now, this is the thing. Like, I I know there's a lot of people that have certain opinions about a moon phase, okay? In a moon phase, you know, you hear the full moon, the bass are going to come up and spawn, or the new moon, the bass are going to come up and spawn. But there's times that the bass are just going to come and spawn because the conditions are right. In between a moon, warming trend, it's just right. And that sort of is what happened. Yes, we had a moon coming, but it sort of is what happened when – Ultimately, we got there. I felt like those fish were pulling up and they were actually spawning. And the best fishing was actually during practice. Now, we're talking four or five days prior to the new moon, which when you put that on paper and you look at it, you're like, that is the time I want to be fishing, which I've seen sometimes throughout my career where actually the days prior to the full moon and the new moon, this is actually when the fish pull up three, four, five days prior to. So that just gives you sort of like an understanding. Maybe that's like what you're dealing with. If you have a full moon, if you're living up um, up north and, and you and you see that coming, maybe that's typically the males will pull up first and you'll start to see that. So practice was pretty good on falls. I caught some fish. Then you go to Sharon Harris. Now Sharon Harris, the power plant, like it didn't seem like it was generating that much. The water was very similar. And it was like everything happened very quickly, okay? When what I mean by that is I, I get to Sharon Harris, I graph around, I don't see him. I run around the lake and water 62 degrees and the shatter spawning. I could see birds up the bank. I'm like, man, this might be the deal. Like, there might be a wave that's already gone. And typically a shad spawn is when, you know, shad that they're bait fish that ultimately the bass normally spawn before the shad spawn, okay? That's typically how nature and God made it was like, Okay, bass spawn, and these predator fish spawn, and then the forage base spawns so that they can recoup and ultimately get back to where they're in fighting shape. And I think that's, you know, the main reason. But there's sometimes when things happen very fast, we have big warming trends like we had 80 degrees for set 10 days in a row that your water temperatures go up so high that just everything happens all at once. And that's when it can be a little bit confusing. And that's exactly what happened at heavy hitters. So there's shad spawning, there's fish trying to pull up to spawn, there's pre-spawners. And it was just like all of this stuff was happening. Now, I did not find fish offshore throughout this event. I, I felt like the majority of them were up in that 10 foot of water or less. They weren't grouped up on the post-spawn. They weren't, didn't seem like they were grouped up really good. And the pre-spawn for me, that's not, not saying there wasn't a place in the lake that it didn't happen, but that just doesn't, I never found that place. Now, I will tell you guys, you know, I see a lot of comments and I'm looking through the comments a little bit. Um, I will have a little bit of a Q&A session after. So, like, hold your questions. If you have anything specific you want to ask me, I'll try to get to it and then I'll talk about it and run it down. Just like if I can help you guys out any way I, 
I, I'm going to try to. Okay. Um, now going to going back to Sharon Harris, the thing was I. I went deep, then I went shallow. I saw some fish spawning, and I caught these fish. This is sort of a telltale sign. I'm giving you guys some goods. When you catch a fish up shallow and you know that fish was spawning, if it's a really fat, healthy male, that fish had just pulled up. And that's what it was on Sharon Harris the first day, the second day of practice for our deal. Like, it was every fish that I caught, and I shook off a lot, of t a lot too, was fat. They just pulled up. Okay, they just moved up there in the last basically hour of my practice on Sharon Harris. I didn't have this footage. I had 19 bites on a swim dig, and two of them I accidentally hooked a caught a five and a seven. And I'm like, y'all, like this is going to be insane. I had probably 35 bites that day, and I was like, this is gonna be unreal. So jumping back onto Falls Lake, I felt like I had a little bit of a little idea of what might be going down. The water dropped, the steeper banks were better, um, but I still saw there was some grass that these fish were going to set up on that I thought typically they spawn in. It's called willow grass. I've seen it up in Geist Reservoir where I grew up fishing in Indianapolis, Indiana, um, which is like really a fisher's area. And, I, and I, all over the country, 10 bass will spawn around these places and pre-spawn around these places. So I, I ran that in the tournament, and the first morning of the tournament was very warm. And you guys, I dropped the video, Bernie dropped the video just recently on the channel, breaking down, or uh, just showing you guys some of the fish that I caught. I did not catch a lot of bass, but that morning there's a part of you, I had all these rods that swim jigs and had some bites on swim jig in practice, um, had some bites, I'm um, flipping, but I, I never had bite on top water and I picked up, I just, fe it felt right. I picked up a buzz bait and like my third cast, oh, gets it. I actually was throwing um, a buzz bait a lot like this. Um, this is actually a white one. I was throwing a black one. This is actually uh, an accent buzz bait. Uh, you guys have seen me throw it throughout the years. Um, and I just put a toad on the top over the over the top of him. Um, that's what works for me. A, a lot of times, there's times I'll transition back and forth with a skirt with a soft plastic or a toad, depending on what I'm really doing or what the forage base is or what I'm trying to really, you know, make up. So the thing is, I was throwing a black anodized blade and a black toad. I like black during the spawn because I feel like, especially in a little bit more stained water, I feel like those fish, um, they get to a point where they're protecting in that silhouette. They could see it very well. And it's almost like, especially in low light conditions, black seems to work really well. That's why I throw like a black frog sometimes during the spawn in the stained water. Um, and then when it transitions, I throw like, like a, basically a white toad on there for the shad spawn. So the first day I caught a couple on buzz bait, ended up catching a couple um, on a, uh, caught one on a swim jig and I ended up catching like one site fishing and it was really a grind. It was a grind of a day. I felt like the majority of the fish that I had found in practice, the females had left those places up there shallow. I was throwing a swim bait. I get some bites on that. I get some bites on, on a swim jig. And I could not get the bites that I was getting in practice. And this happens a lot. Like, as a fisherman, we, like, you know, for major league fishing, what we fish, practice in the second day of the tournament, if you're in group B, you're talking about four or five days, six days by the time you end up, you know, four, three, four, five days, um, before you're getting on that body of water, that final day. So a lot can change and a lot can transpire. So those are, for those of you guys that are weekend anglers, this is very similar to that. So you sort of have to anticipate things changing and prepare not to get locked into a specific deal. I, I, and I tell, I talk about that a little bit, um, but I don't, the thing is, I don't like to get super dialed in when the fish are changing a lot in the springtime. This is the biggest tip I know it's sort of like a tip, but not a tip, but that I can give anybody out there. If you're trying to become a better fisherman, you do not necessarily need to get dialed in. You want to have multiple different patterns going because what happens is, especially if you're an angler and a weekend angler that's practicing a week prior to your tournament, the more you get dialed in, the more you get locked in and what happens is ultimately things change and you're sitting there and they were biting a square bell last week and they all came up and started to spawn and you're sitting here with a square bill, and you're like, dude, I can't get a bite. That's the problem. So try multiple different things. Try to find multiple different patterns. That's going to help you to be more consistent 
throughout your tournaments. Now, if you're talking about a post-spawn bite and the fish were offshore schooled up, that's when I want to get dialed in the week before to try to determine, okay, hey, there's a couple schools, hey, brush piles or whatever I'm trying to target, rock piles. I want to find locations um, when the fish are really locked into the position that they're at. So that is sort of like a breakdown of like that. I went off on that one, but I, I definitely wanted to give you guys a little bit of piece of that information. And so as things trans transpired throughout the tournament, I even picked up a small little tube that's like called a stupid tube. It's so basically Terry McWilliams um, in Indiana. A lot of guys actually fished it up in, in Minnesota. It's like just a little rig that I caught fish off of and I actually won an All-American on it. Um, it won the All-American on it. But it's a bait that I just don't throw as much anymore because I, I don't like the hookup ratio. I'd rather throw like a shaky head with like, you know, um, or throw like some other bait, like a small jig or something like that. So, but because it was sort of during that transition, those fish were spawning, post-spawn, spawn, pre-spawn, pre all that. This is a great bait to be able to like pick up something that's finessey, throw it out there with a jig head. It's basically just insert head tube is all it really is. And I, and I started fishing on the little rocky banks and I catch one that's five, nine. You can see that in that video that I literally caught that fish that really was a huge fish for me on on a spinning rod which typically you know when you go to finesse applications you're like i'm not it's not always going to catch little ones it just catches big ones sometimes as well especially when the bite is tough so going into the final day of the elimination round on falls lake the water between the time we left the lake on day one the water um level had come up almost a half of a foot almost three quarters of it it was like right at like 0.6, I believe, 0 0.6, almost like just under three quarters of a foot, just over a half a foot. That is a huge deal in flatter areas. Now you're thinking, okay, you got to understand this. This is my mindset. Now the water was dropping and it stabilized and it was like down low. And then all of a sudden we had some rain and the water came up. Those fish that are in those flatter creeks and those flatter places, they are not trying to spawn because there's nothing to spawn around until that water comes up to where there's enough stuff or there's a very few a lot of times that will spawn because they don't have enough stuff hard stuff to get on so what i feel like happens is when you have that water to rise those fish will come up with it and especially when you have a warming trend um, during a warming trend those fish will start to spawn because now they have that stuff to set up on um, and that's sort of what i was anticipating i caught a couple of fish uh, day two, it falls like on a frog. And that was like, I was actually catching them like one on a shad spawn. And there was like not very me doing that. And one, um, just like fish that I actually had seen in practice. And I actually caught it just going to the bank. Thing was, there was a four or five hours of a lull that I never caught. How many scoreable bass? Zero. Nothing. It was horrible. I could not get a bite. Actually, I broke one off. Uh, um, but it was, I caught on non scoreables. I just could not get it figured out. And 30 minutes, about an hour left in the final period, I, I had to make something, you know, I had to make something happen. And that's when I went up the river into the areas that I felt like fish were going to pull up and spawn that had not pulled up already. So you were thinking about, I'm anticipating that and I'm realizing, okay. I register this is not going down down the lake. I feel like the majority of the females left, the males were there. Uh, they were getting more pressure from us, locals, everything. I need to go up the lake where those fish were fresh that were just in no man's land and now are up on the bank on that freshly flooded cover, even though it was half a foot. That's a huge deal when you're talking about a flat area that has zero cover, and then you put a half a foot of water on a place or a foot of water on a, on a lay down. It's a huge deal. So I go up there 30 minutes ago. I'm flipping, flipping, and I actually got the setup right here. Um, and something that I actually had is started to do is I'm using a braid to a fluorocarbon leader. Um, I, I actually started this at the fire ponds. And we actually have some videos. Watch it. I'll explain it a little bit more later. Um, and I'm throwing 30 pound suffix 131 braid. This is like a super high quality braid. I think it's like 14 carrier, 13 carrier braid. I'm pretty sure. Um, 
I'm not exactly sure on that, but it's like high, it's super high quality. A lot of carriers in this, and I was throwing 30 pound braid and 17 pound sub fluorocarbon. Um, this is advanced fluorocarbon. That's what I just throw. And then I was throwing a little three eight ounce head of three eight ounce weight, and then a California um, craw bandito bug. That's just something for me. If you guys just follow me on Instagram, you guys saw a post yesterday that I was talking about. That's one play to roll. Um, flip it on a four aught straight shank hook. That's what I like. I, I actually tie a polymer knot with this. That's what I like unless I'm punching or I'm flipping super heavy cover. I'll tend to do that with a with a, a snell or I'll snell a knot on there. Um, so that's what I was doing. I went up there. I made a few pitches and I caught, a, I caught one little small one. I rolled to a little area up there that I've never fished. But it just looks fine. I run down through there. I see a couple laydowns. I roll up there, pitch the laydowns. I'll get a bite. Go down the bank. There's a couple good looking little places. I pitch out there, swimming off, set the hook 211, pitch back out there, catch a good one. Almost five pounder, make a cut. So, like, that's the decisions that you have to make in every tournament when you're put in a tough position. A lot of times it's easy to go back to the locations that you've gotten your couple bites in in practice or that morning. And sometimes it's a good call. But there's other times you have to pull an audible. You have to make a decision and you have to trust your gut. That is a huge part of bass fishing. You have to trust what your gut is telling you. It, and, and that is what I did right there. So qualifying for the knockout round um, on Sharon Harris, completely different fishery now. Um Sharon Harris has a lot of grass and those fish had pulled up to ultimately spawn and they were, they were pretty much like ready to roll. Like they were up there. I didn't know how much was going to change from the four or five days of, of, of uh, basically five days that transpired before since I had been there, but I, I'm like instantly thinking like I'm going to crush them on a swim jig, low light at 19 bites, the last hour of practice, like, that long like giant ones and i said we're gonna catch like 50 pounds in the first 30 minutes like i truly thought it was going to be insane what happened i caught one non-scorable on a swim jig one one yep in the first period i'm sitting here and i'm like well, that didn't go real well. And I picked up a wacky worm, a lunker log, five inch wacky style, fired out there on isolated cover, typical doink, one bites it at the hood, catch a couple of squirrels. Now, I don't like, I, you guys know me. If you watch me at all, you know I like to move fast. I, it kills me to slow down. Um, so I'm not big on picking. I, I will throw finesse tactics if I have to, or pick up a wacky worm if I have to, if I feel like I'm in an area that it's the deal, but that was not my whole deal. And so going into that second period, I decided to transition to throwing a swim bait and throwing and flipping a bandito bug and looking for sight fish. The sun's starting to get up. I can start to see a little bit. And at that point in time, I caught a couple fish on a swim bait, just reeling around those reeds a little bit lighter. They had belly weight swim bait, just reeling around those reeds, catching them. And I could tell instantly from the five days that it transpired, those fish went from just being up there to <clears throat> that were fat, healthy, to being almost like super skinny. Like they'd been up there, like you're like, dang, man, like you, they, they aren't eating, they aren't eating anything. They've literally been up there protecting their beds. Um, for for days and you just you it was crazy to see how that transitioned from them being super aggressive when they first got up there in low light conditions which tends to be a big deal to ultimately going to being a little bit more difficult to catch and being more pressured after they had caught once or twice or once or see more baits to get to the point where they start to see stuff. And they're like, I'm not freaking buying that. I'm just not going to do it. Like they just know they're like, they get harder to catch and it can happen, especially pressure. Pressure is the biggest thing that kills um, consistent or bites. Like it's, it's harder to catch them. Obviously if they have gotten hooked or have, have felt like, you know, they're, they're seeing a lot of baits. So without further ado, I went 
through a couple different things and I caught a few fish. I was in a good position. And this is like the moment where $50,000 is on the line, like $50,000, like for big fish, like, and I go down this pocket. I see this big one, really big one. It's up on the bed. Um, and she's up on the bed and I couldn't like, it's windy and stuff. I'm sitting there and I, I look and I fish for this fish for no joke. About 60 minutes, about an hour, 50, 50 to 60 minutes. I'm throwing multiple different. Uh, I actually started with a bandito bug, a regular size bandito bug with a like California crawl, three ounce weight, shaken on bed. I picked up big baits. I picked up swim baits. I picked up a drop shot. I picked up everything that I could think of because at that point in time, a six pounder was big fish. So I was throwing that right there and I had the male bite it several times. I shook him off. And the reason I shook him off is typically it's easier to catch the female. If you can get the male fired up, the female will sometimes commit to the bed and it can help you catch that female. So with it being a $50,000 fish, I'm sure, I'm pretty sure it was at that point in time. I shook the male off several times. The male is a three pounder. Like it's a three pounder. And I get to the point where I shake that fish off. Finally, I'm like, dude, I'm just gonna catch this male and I'm gonna get the heck out of here. I'm out. And I had thrown everything. I had thrown everything that I could. And I typically do not like throwing a white bait in the bed because typically it's harder to get those fish to bite. Something that's not as natural as a you know a blue baby bandito bug or creature bait in general. So I do like so I picked up the 3.3 inch bandito bug. Um, this is the junior size, and I was throwing a three eighths ounce weight with a four aught little hook right there, four aught flipping hook. And I pitched it out there, and it was you could just tell that fish did not like that bait being around. And that's a lot of what sight fishing is about: is each fish is completely different. Now, there's fisheries you'll figure out, like, hey, they don't like this or they don't like that, and but like or a day but there's all each one is completely different and you have to like treat them like a, a deer okay each deer is completely different you know some are super nocturnal some are easy is, is all get out and run around and like they're out in the daylight all the time it's the same thing with a bass up there on the bed each one is completely different and so that's why you see me with a lot of different rods on the front deck constantly trying to think of a bait that the fish will bite or want to react to better than another so at the very minute, last minute, I picked this bait up, pitch it out there, and not thinking, I'm like, well, we're just going to try. And sure enough, she goes over there, bites it, set the hook, get the fish in the boat, seven and a half pounder, and went for $1,000. Now, this video will drop on the channel um, here in like, I'm thinking like tomorrow. So check back on that one. But that was the, so I'm not going to be like long winded and everything, but I am, I'm trying to like dive into this stuff and I don't want to go to every little detail, but I wanted to give you guys the viewer, you guys see us have fun. You see us interact and be able to hang out with DC, Mark and Adrian and just, you know, me BSing around and, and all of that stuff, but you don't get always the in-depth side of things. And I know from growing up watching anglers um, and trying to learn, like, I just want to help out people are out there that are trying to learn and this is the kind of stuff that i'm learning every day like i learned a lot this last week that i did not know like i didn't i don't know all these things it's stuff that's constantly changing and you try to remember that stuff or write that down but those are the things that really help an angler mature that's why you hear like the whole term of like there's no there's no substitution for time on the water that is typically why, uh, because you learn a lot the more you're out there on the bar, on on the water, and you're fishing more diverse fisheries, multiple different you know largemouth, smallmouth, spider bass, all of those things. So all of that um, ended up third place at Sharon Harris knockout on one fifty thousand dollars for that big fish, um, and I caught like I said I caught all my bass, pretty much all my bass um, that day on this guy right here. And that was a huge, huge deal. I just figuring it out. And that bait, and the reason why I picked this bait up. Okay, I'm gonna tell you real quick here. Hold up one second. Hold up one second. Sizzle. Hey, buddy. Call me. 
Oh, you're good. I'm, I'm actually on live on, on YouTube live. Let me, let me holler back at you. Sizzle. DT. Um, so real quick here, let me, let me just say, <laughs> we just always, I was throwing 17 pound four carbon on this rod real quick. You're seven, three heavy. Um, and I'll tell you real quick here, I, the reason why I really do like this bait, one of the best, I feel like it's really, truly is like one of the best bed fishing baits that, that I've played with. Um, even in the natural colors is because I can put a four out hook in there, a big four out hook. And when that fish grabs, you could see like way back there, if he nips it like back here, like he doesn't have a whole lot to nip before he's getting hooked. So that's the reason why I did that. Now the peg, I did keep it, kept it on peg because a lot of times like I'll pitch in the bed and it'll just sort of like lay there and sort of just like, and, and when you have a fish, that is really like nipping at your bait. A lot of times not having a weight pegged allows that fish to get it because it's obviously lighter there. And when you set the hook, you can actually catch this fish a little bit easier. So that's a little tip right there. I, I, I typically do not peg my weight. Now, as far as the reel, I was throwing eight, three to one gear ratio. This is my signature series reel. Okay, real quick here. You guys have seen a little bit of it. Um, this is a awesome reel. Like, I mean, and I'm not saying that because obviously it's my signature series reel. I truly believe it is. Um, this is a paradigm uh, reel. It's only exclusively available at Academy through academy.com or through the store. This is the freest reel that uh, Ducket Fishing and that whole crew, um, like what I mean by free is like it pitches really good. It casts like, like it's super free. Now you can get some backlashes because it is free, meaning like you can make the perfect little pitches and stuff. But it's for me, that's like exactly what I wanted, and they knocked it out of the park with this one. So, exclusively at Academy, I will try to drop a, um, I'll drop a comment after this post to like for some of the people that are watching this right now. Um, if you guys want to look at them, check, check them out. Um, it's definitely, I mean, I'm gonna, I'll keep you updated throughout, you know, what's going on, but I, I'm really impressed with the first few months of fishing that, fishing that reel. So, that's really all it is. Like I went and I had a good time. You know, I love Falls Lake. I love Jordan. I love Sharon Harris. It really showed out. That whole area showed out big time. Um, and, and I'm really, truly impressed with all the people there. Uh, I really was humbled by how many people came out, supported us um, day in, day out. Um, and like, I just really appreciate everyone there. Like I had, you know, 12, 15 people, um, 12, 15 boats on me, you know, following me around on, on Sharon Harris. I'm sitting in like sixth and nobody gave up. Like I just really appreciated all the love um, and all the people there. So without further ado, I'm going to give you guys probably like 10 more minutes. So start dropping some questions and I'm going to maybe like five, 10 more minutes. Uh, and then I'm going to try to answer some of that. So right here, big bass, little bass, what is your PB? 1238, big one, caught him flipping down in Florida. 12, 1230, I think it was a 38. It might have been a 33 the first time I weighed him, 1233, 38. It was a 12 and a quarter, almost a 12 and a half, somewhere in there. It was a big one. Um, wait, so you're actually in. Let me see here. Um, I'm trying to see here. Uh, so have you ever fished Arizona? Um, and how much do you hate it? I've never fished Arizona. Like I know, uh, Josh Bertrand's one of the, the best fishermen, um, that I know from out that way. I think B heights at from out that way as well. I know there's some really good fishermen. I think even, uh, Dean Ross fish like lives out that way. And I've heard a lot of good things. I, I don't know. I'm sure it's, I'm sure there's great lakes. I'm sure there's tough lakes. It's like anything else, but I'm looking forward. I'm hoping that major league team goes out West next year. Um, uh, I would love to go out and fish some of the fisheries that are out that way. Um, let me see here. I'm going to go down through here. Muddy bottom lake suggestions, very little rocks. Um, this is a good, this is actually a pretty interesting deal. Cause like a lot of our lakes have mucky bottom. If we don't have grass, typically those lakes have a little bit of grass. But at that point, I'm like a lot of times when I have a very silted in lake or a lot of lakes where I grew up in Indiana, they were like that. Like you had a lot of silt, a lot of muck, not a lot of hard bottom. So, excuse me, y'all. 
the thing is, any hard bottom at that point in time is a major player. So obviously any hard bottom like clay or um, if there is some rock or if there is something hard is going to be the deal. And then if you have a lot of muck, say you're fishing a river system, I tend to actually flip a drop shot a lot on like uh, maybe a quarter. And you can flip a drop shot around or pitch around, not flip it like this, but like pitch it around. Um, and that'll keep that bait up off the bottom. I don't have like a big giant long leader. I have like maybe like a four or five inch leader. So that'll keep it out of the muck and allow you to get those bites. It keeps that bait sort of out of all that. So that's why it's something to try. What's your favorite pond bait if you fish them? Um, I would have to say a frog, a top water buzz bait. That is my favorite to catch a fish on. Now, if the fishing is very difficult in that pond, you got to try a wacky worm, a lunker log, green pumpkin blue, fire it out there, especially spawn, post spawn. You can't go wrong with that. So it all depends on the time of year. You know, springtime, probably a lipless crankbait, maybe like even a uh, vibrating jig, something like that. But there's a lot of, I'm going to say there's one particular deal. Um, what type of Wiley X's do you use? So that was another really big deal for me. Um, I use the Wiley X Omega frames and they have a, friend, or a lens called Captivate. And I believe it's like a, it's just like a really high quality lens. Um, the original lens is great, but this lens is like super crystal clear. I could see the fish a heck of a lot better. Um, they've really done a really good job. They actually made a post on social about them. So you can sort of like see some of the details there. Um, but that is, they're awesome. They did a really good job with that lens. And that is the big key when you pick sight fishing lenses or like, like sight fishing glasses. You want something that has a high quality lens. Um, and at first I always thought like glass was the way to go. Um, but I got to the point where I definitely would not do glass the biggest reason glass is not a good deal in fishing is literally a weight has come back and hit guys in their in their glasses and broke that glass and guys have lost their i actually know someone lost their vision um because of that so don't like i would suggest staying away from the glass no matter what manufacturer you go with on your lenses of choice um but definitely the Omega Captivate, uh, Omega lenses or frames, Captivate lenses, um, awesome. Okay. What is your go-to uh, jig trailer for the pre-spawn? If I'm using a finesse jig, a Bandito Bug Jr. If I'm using a, um, and this is sort of something like, so if you guys are using a Bandito Bug at all, or if I'm using a regular jig, it's actually just a Trey Bandito Bug. That is my favorite jig trailer, but it gets a little bit pricey to use as a trailer. So, what I try to do is like, say you're flipping a bandito bug throughout the season. I would like, if you end up tearing it up and you can't flip it anymore, like Texas rigget, you cut it in half, you put it in your jig trailer box. That's what I try to actually, I'll do that quite a bit. I'll cut it in half, put it in the jig trailer box. I'm ready to roll. So that's something just a little bit of he no heads up on, on that deal. So, uh, were the bed fish at Sharon Harris in the shade? So, it Sharon Harris, they were it all dependent because the shade was depending on where the sun was positioned throughout the day. Some were, some weren't. Um, it wasn't really a big different, you know. I it wasn't really the main, it wasn't about shade necessarily. Um, what to throw in Rayburn in June? I don't know Rayburn really well. I had a good bass fest event there um, in the middle of May. I would assume those fish would probably be getting offshore pretty good. Uh, typically like brush piles are going to be a major player grass edges that are going to be major points or places where those fish are going to start to group up in the summertime so i would say big deep down crankbaits one of my favorite is a, a dt20 um a hair jig could be another really good one a spoon and then probably like maybe a swim bait and um maybe like a, a slim shake like a little bit larger slim shake worm on a texas rig on the brush piles so that's what i would recommend um what is your favorite tournament win my favorite tournament win, um, out of all the tournament wins, the most meaningful that gave me the opportunity to be in this position talking to you all um, was the All-American, uh, BFL All-American. Your boy didn't have a whole lot, uh, coming from a whole lot, and um, I just was given a lot of – that was an opportunity for me to make it 
to the big leads and uh, I won hundred thousand dollars there. So that was the most meaningful um, event for me. Um, what would be the best bait for Oahe? I don't know, Ethan. I, I, I love like Oahe. I hope we come back because that place is unreal. And that, and for the, you, you guys who don't know where Oahe is, it's up in like South Dakota, right? South Dakota. Well, North Dakota, South Dakota, both, but I would love to go back there. Um, can you talk about your come up as a professional angler? Yeah, I can definitely do that. I could be like, uh, I could talk for days on that. So I'm not gonna, that could, it's gonna be a different video. I want, <laughs> um, just to give you guys an idea of what went down is basically I I made my I went through the BFLs, um, the Major League Fishing now was FLW Major League Fishing BFL trail to qualify through the regional to the All American, um, and like I started with not a heck of a lot. Like I didn't have a big fancy boat. I didn't have um, my uncle had a bass boat. Uh, I borrowed a boat. Um, I had a couple of people that were really nice and, and that supported me and thought I was going to be something someday and gave me the opportunity to use their boat and fish in the tournaments. And so um, I'll be forever indebted in those, those people that, that gave me that opportunity. Um, and so I just worked my way up. And I, I think the biggest thing is everybody sees the end game of okay you're here at a professional level you're a professional angler you're doing well on the tour and you see that but yet you, the, all the struggles and everything behind it is something that you don't get to see nearly as much what went all into it all um there's a lot of sacrifices there's a lot of things that you had to continue to work hard and um man i just that was that was the story man i there's a lot to it i could go on forever about it i'm not going to tell you guys all maybe one maybe one other time but that's that's what sort of started me um bass fishing and i i'm very fortunate to have my, my dad my my uncle maury um all the people that supported me growing up in Indiana, indianapolis in indiana um to push me to get to this level um post spawn in texas what are you looking for well, the post spawn bite is one of my favorite bites because at the end of the day, what does that mean? Top waters, shad spawn, top water. Those two things for me, money. Okay. First hour of the morning, most unreal bite in the morning you could ever ask for. Like, it's like crazy. Like, coosh, 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 they're biting, they, they're eating shad somewhere. Sometimes they'll spawn on the grass. Sometimes they'll spawn offshore on points. Sometimes they'll be spawning on bushes, on gra on trees, on, on cypress trees. It's just, it's unreal that first hour from typically. Um, now, as the day goes on, if it's a flat, calm, sunny day, I'm going to start to move out and look for like the first like brush pile or grass edge or places that they're going to be out in front of like main points. These fish are going to start to stage up or not stage up. They're going to start to move back out of the spawning areas. And so I would look for like places, hard bottom points and places like that, you know, pretending really just depending on if you're a clear water fishery or a dirty water fishery, I would say 15 to, you know, 12, 10 to 20 foot of water is going to be where those fish are going to group up first. Um, J. Wills, do you think the spawn is later than usual this year? You know, I've actually sort of had this conversation with DC. I had it with Mark a little bit because we were talking about this. And it has been a little bit of a weird year. Um, it's been really cold at first. And then it transitioned to being like super hot. It's been like hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold. I I do think it is a little bit behind. I think it's a couple weeks behind. But it's crazy because places like Ohio, one of my best buddies, Whitney Stevens, he lives up there in Ohio. And like there's bass spawning in Ohio and spawning in Indiana. Um, and so that's a little early for some of those places like to be spawning the first week of April. So some places like in the south are – late where other places are actually early so it's all dependent on where you're at in the country but yeah, I, I would say overall down south uh southeast south um it has been a little bit of a later spawn um if you didn't run a triton what would you run man jackson i i i don't know i have uh, been running a triton for a while now so i um there's a lot of good boat companies out there a lot of good boats um, but I really, you know, I like my Triton right now. It's done 
done done me good. It's been a pretty good boat the last few years, and um, pretty pretty pumped, thankful to be with them. Um, frog rod from Tracy. So the rod I actually use for my frog rod is this one right here. It's a seven three heavy action. Um, so the thing is that the newer one, the newer seven three heavies. Um, this is the rod I use just a little bit on the heavy. It's a, lot, a little bit on the heavier side. I throw with like, you know, 40, 50 pound braid, normally 50 pound braid, but that's what I like. I like this rod a lot. Uh, it's my signature series. Then when I'm skipping around boat docks or fishing grass, if I'm fishing like matted vegetation, that's when I'll go to a seven, six heavy where I can have like a longer cast and I set the hook. That's typically what I do. So. Um, what is your favorite Guggen bait? Sorry, guys. I'm trying to like, read through this and try to give you guys um, my favorite Guggen bait. It would have to be a bandito bug. I mean, made $70,000 on that sucker last week. Uh, made you counted for a lot of fish. Um, so it would have to be a bandito bug. I mean, just, and if I had to pick one color I couldn't live without, it would probably be blue baby, believe it or not. Green pumpkin's a good one, but blue baby's my favorite, hands down. Uh, is Bandito Bug better than its own, as its own, or on its own, or as a big trailer, or both? Thinking of trying it out soon. Um, so I like a Bandito Bug for both. Um, I cut the Bandito Bug in half when I'm putting it on a trailer on a jig. And then I will put it, I'll use the whole thing when I'm flipping it or pitching it. That's what I typically use. Um, that's what I like to use. And it seems to work really well. Um, so it's really, it's just, it's just a really good profile works well. Um, anchor poles worth the money for weekend warriors. You know, it's, it's, it's tough. Cause it's like, it depends on where you're at. That's a really good question. Are power poles or anchor poles, uh, worth the money? I would say this, if you fish a, a lot of shallow water, five, six foot, seven foot and less. And that's where you love to fish the bank. I would suggest getting power poles or, you know, that's what I would suggest. And you could try with, we can do it with one. It's just, you're going to pivot a little bit. Um, if you are an angler that likes to be off of the bank or deeper water, then I would suggest getting a, like all tracks or Lawrence ghost or the Garmin force, I think is what it is. Something that has that anchor button um, is what I would ultimately do. So, uh, why does an academy ship to Mexico? I, I don't know. Them suckers are, I, you know, I'm sure. I'm sure they're trying. I'm sure they're trying to get it figured out. Is the new seven three heavy uh, heavy a faster action or still parabolic? It is a parabolic bend. That is what I like. It's just a preferred um, deal for me. So, like, I like a parabolic bend. Um, it has a little bit more backbone to it is more so what it is. A seven three heavy has a little bit more backbone. Um, let's see here. How much time do you spend practicing in off season and just as a whole? That's a really good question because I, I, there's a point in time you have to take a break. In anything that you do, especially when you go really hard and you try to fish um, as much as I do. Um, but people ask me all the time, is like bass fishing still, you do you love it? Like, duh, like I love it. Like that's what I get out of bed every morning, excited to go fishing. Now it's tougher on the tough fisheries where you can't get a bite or just not working real well. And then when you have tough tournaments, it does make it difficult. But um, I do practice a lot in the off season. I work on things that I'm not good at, meaning like techniques that I need to work on or new techniques that are coming out. Um, or I play with electronics or I play with, you know, just something to help me stay on top of my game. The issue is a lot of anglers do tend to do this. They want to go when they go on the water, they want to spend time doing what they love, which I me for me, it's top water. Uh, I love catching them on different things as well. Offshore, I'm catching them all different ways, but the top water is my favorite. That's probably what I would say I'm one of the best at. Like I understand it, but it doesn't help me as an angler if I can all I throw is a top water. I have to adjust and make decisions and try to learn different techniques 
to where I can make that adjustment when I'm dealt with the same conditions, sort of kind of, and know like, hey, I need to pick this up. Hey, I need to pick that up. Yeah, you're always going to fall back to what you know um, in your confidence base, but there's something about that that I would suggest, like just trying to learn um, other techniques that you maybe might not like to fish. Um, make those at least something that you know and understand, and that'll help you be a more well-rounded angler. How do you adjust if you get beat to your first spot? Well, that that happens all the time. I mean, you just have you you have to. You never. You obviously hope. Like, there's okay. For instance, okay, say it's a offshore tournament and they're schooled up, and you're a late boat draw. That's part of it. It stinks, but more than likely, if it's a pretty big point um, and it's a community place, you're not going to be the first one there. So you have to make your adjustments accordingly. Um, I always try to have multiple different ideas and different things. Like, all right, what's the worst case scenario if I get there and I can't get on that place? Where am I going to go? And it all depends on how much stuff you have. You could try to pull up within the vicinity of the area. If that's all you have, you could pull up in the vicinity of the area and fish around. But typically that stinks because you're seeing a guy reel them in. And you're just sitting there like it's a complete like it mentally can mess you up. So I typically will run, go somewhere else, um, fish something close by if I really think that spot is that good. I um, mean, try to wait my turn to get on that place. Or if it's a spot where there's a big school and I can be polite and I say, hey, you know, do you mind if I fish here? Are you beat me here? Um, do you mind if I fish here with you? Like something like that. Um, some anglers will be like, Hey, yeah, come on in. No problem. And so others will be like, you'd rather have it. So sometimes they will, if you let you in, like, you know, you could fish side by side with somebody. If they don't respect them and just come back when it's open. So that's what I would suggest. How do I feel about co-anglers? Shane, that's a really good one. Y'all, y'all are throwing out. I'm, I'm sitting here. Like I told y'all five minutes. It's like I, I could sit here and read all these forever. Co-anglers are awesome. Um, I was a co-angler growing up. I fished um, a couple bass opens as a co-angler with my buddy Sean Wieda, and I learned a lot because of that. I learned what not to do. I learned how to adjust, seeing some of the best um, make adjustments and seeing some of the bad decisions made. I You can learn a lot from being a co-angler. And the thing is, is you have to realize that at the end of the day, you are probably – not always going to get a great draw and you're going to have to do the best you can out of that back of that boat. And just, you know, it's, it can be difficult because sometimes you one day you'd be on with somebody that's on them and you're catching them every cast. And the next day you're with somebody that's not on anything and you have to make the best of that day. The biggest advice for co anglers out there that I can give is not to do what the guy in the front of the boat is doing. If the guy in front of the boat is cranking, you need to be throwing a finesse tactic. If the guy in the front of the boat is doing, just do something a little bit different. If he's fishing in the top of the water column, fish in the bottom of the water column. Um, you have to make adjustments accordingly. And that is what the best co anglers out there do. That's what I've seen day in and day out and some of the best I've ever fished with uh, have whooped me at the back just doing something completely different. Um, let me see here. Did the squirt come into play for, the, for last week? Yeah, I used the squirt gun. I use a squirt gun for um, a lot of pollen in North Carolina. And so I was using that squirt gun squirting. Um, these pollen coves with basically dish soap and water. And that would sort of split some of that. So that's sort of, I mean, it's a tip that helps um, see those fish a little bit better. Uh, Chase said he just bought my rod. I appreciate it, man. Let me know how that goes. Um, currently, let me see here. Y'all are just typing so dang fast. Calm down. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Favorite smallmouth bait. You know, for the people up north or the people that fish around the Tennessee River and have a small mouth or out eastern Tennessee, um, I would say the favorite smallmouth bait is probably still a jerk bait. They just bite a jerk bait probably better than anything. Um, I mean, a drop shot's pretty hard to beat. A rattle and Ned's pretty hard to beat. There's just not like there's not like one thing. Uh, spot lock. Oh, it says spot lock or pan off. Pan optics one upgrade. 
I'm going to say, I'm going to say, it depends on where you're at in the country. If you're up north, I'm going to say pan optics or forward facing sonar. Um, if you're down south, prop and you fish offshore a lot, maybe I don't know. I'd still go with the with the with the active target. That's what I would do. Active target or pan optics, whichever one you know. That's what I would suggest. Like that's it's pretty cool. It's not always the deal all the time, but it definitely allows you to understand more about fish behavior. I've learned more in the last couple of years about fish behavior because of the forward facing sonar than I ever have in probably 10 years prior. So really something that teaches you a lot. The issue is you can get locked in very easily um, and not catch nothing because you see fish and you cannot catch them. It happens. I've done it. I've learned. I'm like, gosh, I still have issues with it sometimes. It's just frustrating. Best place to fish in Indiana. Ben, I'm going to stay it straight up. I think it's Guy's Reservoir there and Fishers. It's astronomical for the, I guess, the, the, the ramp fee, like this is crazy, no joke. It's like fifty. I don't even know what it is now. It was like twenty five dollars, thirty dollars on the weekends. Um, now it's probably like fifty dollars. I don't know how much it is, but it's it's crazy. So I would say that I heard Monroe's coming back too. I heard it's really good. So um, Tyler says, do you prefer tungsten weights or lead? I I prefer tungsten, but I'm also I'm gonna be straight up with you. I and get tungsten through BMC. It does not cost me anything. So that's another thing. Like if you were on a budget, uh, maybe lead weights would be the way to go. So now some states you can't use lead. I, I don't believe some like northeastern states. I don't believe you can. So you might check in on that as well. Um, do you still use a tube and why not bed fish with it? Okay, so it's crazy because Alan Jones wins the tournament on a tube. I, I'm pretty sure he did. My issue with a tube when I'm sight fishing is I cannot get a direct fall. So say I pitch over there and I want to get it to this spot, okay, this spot right here. What happens with the tube is I pitch it out there and it goes over here, over there. With like a bandito bug or a crawl, I pitch it in there and that weight goes down. It goes right there. So that is the main reason why I do not fish or bed fish for, with a tube. Now you can, if you pitch it out there, like beyond it and drag it to it, if you're just sitting there shaking it. Yeah, you can. I just, and I also more like the only issue with the tube is you tend to lose more fish on a tube. Yep. Tube is a fish losing some on Texas rig and it really is. I mean, I've lost more fish on a tube than probably any bait stop plastic ever, ever thrown what is your go-to bait when the bass won't bite ah it's, it, there's so many different things i would say a wacky worm this time of year would probably be it uh and i'm going down through here i'm probably going to sign off about hours so we have about two more minutes ish left so i'm going to try to pick a good one for the last one I'm looking and he just y'all are killing me. Like I'm trying, I want to pick a really good one. Like, ah. Uh, oh my gosh, it's all this stuff. What's your thoughts on the hundred mega live coming soon? I'll I'll talk about that real quick here. Um, I don't know anything about it. I don't really I've I've heard some things that it's a larger cone. I, I know there has to be some issues probably with it right now because they haven't had it out. They've said they were going to be out for a long time, and it's like, oh, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Um, and it hasn't come out, so I'm assuming they're trying to perfect it. Um, I, I will say, like, out of all the units that I have, the, the most buggy can be the Hummingbirds units for me. Like, I've had some issues with them being a little bit buggy and, like, having updates work real well. But – make a solid unit um and so i'm assuming they're gonna come out with something really good i you just don't know what's gonna happen on that one um for someone going to college hold up i just lost that one sorry i just literally had it sorry guys i'm trying to find oh, i just had it sorry y'all and Best tip would give a high school tournament. All right, this is the last one we're roll. What's the best tip 
that you would give a high school tournament angler. I think the biggest tip of advice that I can give to anyone um, that is trying to become a better fisherman, I think I've already sort of covered one of those, and that's working on your skill set of, uh, of of trying multiple different things, of baits and ta- techniques that you're not good at. That is one. Trusting your gut, number two. Number three, the final would be um, tr- try to pick a couple people that say you fish a couple different lakes around you. Try to keep your circle pretty small um, and respect if someone takes you fishing, okay, for instance, say your neighbor down the street takes you fishing and he takes you to these spots and you catch all these fish off these spots. Don't go back to those spots and go reel them in all the time and tear up his spots. Go and and, and try to learn from what he actually taught you because fishing with multiple people is really actually good to learn as a learning experience. But the problem is when you get messed up a little bit is if you tend to go back to those same areas, that's when it becomes a little bit wonky. You want to make sure you're respecting the other angler that took the time out. It's his day or her day to take you fishing and show you something. And so respecting someone else, um, their technique or their spot, not telling all your buddies about it, that's probably the biggest tip of advice. I made some mistakes when I was younger because I didn't realize, I didn't know. Um, and I think that that is something that I, I want to pass that along and say like, hey, um, it's great to fish with a lot of people um, and, and learn from people, but just try to utilize what they're teaching you. Don't necessarily go back to the locations so anyway so thank you guys so much for hopping on here we have 447 people right now um if you enjoyed this video make sure to give me a thumbs up we truly appreciate every each and every one of you like we are trying to constantly drop content i'm going to try to do these a little bit more because i i want to give you guys more of an in-depth look on what's ultimately going on and like i went a little bit in depth and hopefully you guys have learned something throughout this and if I didn't get to your comment, I apologize. I'm going to try to uh, maybe next time. So what I'm trying to think of uh, maybe it's like maybe a Monday or a Tuesday after every single event, I will try to do one of these lives and just sort of maybe talking about a little bit about what that event happened or what happened. And I might even try to do one every week. So um, drop a comment once this thing goes live below um, and let me know what you guys are wanting to see. Um, thank you guys so much for watching and we will see you on the next go round.